Hello, and welcome to Two Pews in a Pod. Join us as we explore faith in a modern world at Evangelical Lutheran Church in Frederick, Maryland. Now, here is your host, Pastor Paul Baglios. I'm Paul Baglios. And I'm Daniel Catalano. Welcome again to this podcast, Two Pews in a Pod. Today, we are recording the fourth of four planned episodes regarding the Episcopal Church, uh, because our brother in Christ, Daniel Catalano, Director of Music Ministries here at Evangelical Lutheran Church, is an Episcopalian, a soon-to-be formally candidate for uh, holy orders in the Episcopal Church, meaning ordination to the priesthood of the Church's ministry. And we thought it would be a good idea for the members and friends of this congregation maybe to learn a little more about the Episcopal Church than they had known previously. For this fourth and final episode, I'm going to open this widely to Daniel with this question. So if you were uh, introducing the Episcopal Church to someone who knows nothing about it, um, hoping to inspire them perhaps to experience um, the ministry of the Episcopal Church, wanting to help them appreciate what they might experience in the Episcopal Church, what would you be most eager for people to know and to be alert for regarding the Episcopal Church? It's a really good question. So I'm, I'm thinking just as a backdrop... Um, so I'm a cradle Episcopalian, born and raised, um, which is not um, not terribly common anymore. Uh, but I, I think back to what grasped my attention. What, what was it about church, about the Episcopal church, that really kept me engaged? And I, apart from any of the pageantry with the liturgy or any of the conversations we talked about bishops or processes for me the liturgy uh is really what kept that consistent pace um episcopal liturgy i think while it shares a number of resources with other uh, protestant denominations as well as roman catholic i think having that be not only relatively consistent, but only later realizing the historical importance and rooting me into the life of Christians since the first century. Mm. Um, I, I, for me, I think that has been the most, I think, I think if someone were just getting their feet wet about the Episcopal Church, my invitation would be come on Sunday, which, mm should be for all denominations but i think yes. the i think for me exp- really really experience any process of the liturgy whether it's high church or low church because i think there are some bones to the liturgy that we have from the prayer book uh which i think really ground us in that Again, applicable to a lot of other denominations, but nothing we do is on accident. That nothing that we do is frivolous mm-hmm. or just sort of thrown in um, while prayers, uh, whether they're written in the last 50 years, collects, recent collects that have been written, or ones that we found from St. Chrysostom, a, a Eastern Orthodox uh, saint, Everything has this weighty intention to it, that if we're going to bring it in and pray or if we're going to go from one particular act of worship as a community to another act, everything is so intentional. And I think just letting that wash over someone. Um, I remember as an early as an early practitioner, as a child, one of my favorite things to do was to memorize uh, uh, the prayers, and so once I, I you know, I, I, I remember uh, memorizing the Lord's Prayer and memorizing the, you know, and then of course they would switch it. Uh, uh, but it was when I went to uh, college that I, I think, appreciated the fact that when I attended another Episcopal church, it was pretty much 
because mm. we were going off the prayer book, it was the same prayer. And so what I would often say about my mother or my father, that they are pray- on Sunday, they are praying mm. the same prayers, pretty much the same liturgy, that sense of connectiveness, not only to the saints of the past, but the body of Christ now. So I'm going to make a highly appreciative and embarrassingly ignorant response. Embarrassingly ignorant because I can't remember the name of the book and I can't remember the name of the author. That's all right. That's, a, that's what edits are for. <laughs> right. <laughs> but some years ago, in fact, Sharon and I had both, my wife Sharon and I had both read this book. Again, can't think of the title, can't think of the author, but a woman wrote a book describing how in adulthood, I, and I don't remember if she had had any religious experience in her past, but she had come to a point of wanting to immerse herself, mm. um, wanting to make a connection within herself to the faith of a community um, outside herself. And she ended up choosing an Episcopal congregation and as a commitment she made to herself, she worshiped with that congregation mm. through an entire church year. Mm. And I don't, I don't think that she then stopped right, um, right. and gave it up. But the book is about her experience being immersed in the liturgy of this Episcopal congregation through an entire church year, which, as you know, is a way of ritually rehearsing the biblical narrative, especially um, as it lifts up the coming, the life, and the promises of Jesus. Mm. And she wrote very eloquently. She was very stirred by her experience, but she is someone who would have resonated well with your invitation Mm. Come on a Sunday morning. Right, right. So I'm going to go deeper now. Please. Let, let's say that I have. Let's say that you, um, Pastor Catalano, um, have invited me uh, to come to a congregation that you're serving, which will be this one, by the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> Let y'all sort that out. Right. Um, and I have. And let's say I've come now several times, and Mm. what you're describing has moved me. I have felt myself drawn into the richness of the larger church's witness through the liturgy as Episcopalians um, practice it and offer it. And now I'm saying, I want to go deeper. Um, Mm. Now what do you? Now what do you invite me to? Well, in in pretty good Anglican style, my thought is both and that there's well, there's a variety of options. Um, uh, the if it's the liturgy that has drawn you in, um, there are two recommendations that I would say. First and foremost would be to be engaged in some kind of practical hands-on ministry Mm. because I think that's the other part as we dig deeper that this liturgy is not merely meant for show this is not to have the full pageantry and then great we'll have our coffee and go about our week that that the words the prayers the history of this liturgy and of this book Um, is meant to inspire the saints to then go out and do Mm. the work. Um, We we talk a lot in seminary that um, that our our role as pastoral leaders is to not only empower, um, no, empower, yeah, to empower the saints uh, um, that who are here, the laity which makes up most of the church. So that would be my first um, suggestion is to take that inspiration mm. and use that to be God's hands and feet in the world. Um, and then the another way to um, that I would suggest is to become more involved in the liturgy in some fashion. Mm. I know from my own personal experience that uh, those who have really resonated find only more deeper meaning when they serve. I know that, Mm. at least in my early experience, I thought 
I thought for me, communion was this centerpiece. And for me, it still very much is. But when I served communion to my parents and to my brother and my sister, like actually, mm. you know, I, I had the chalice, I, I was able to commune for them. Um, that to me was so incarnational that it was this living history, this everything just intertwined mm. uh, to have this um, this richness mm -hmm. that is uh, quite difficult to me to, for me to articulate at the moment. But no. it's it's it, it, just <sighs> that kind of participation where I see. Um, friends of mine who have joined the church and then are getting more involved and they're reading, you know, they're reading James or they're re they, they start reading more and, and they get choked up. These are services or, or lessons that they've heard before, but in the practice of being more involved in doing it, that they just like, like it's, it, it just becomes more ta tangible, I think. It is, I'll riff off of that. Please. This is somewhat of a, of a, diversion. But it's why, for example, that in our practice here at Evangelical Lutheran Church, while we have a number of roles that people will sign up to do in advance, like assisting minister, um, for almost every service, I like to invite people who have started to gather for the service to say, would you serve communion mm. with us today? Because I think that does for a lot of people, it draws us into more deeply what's happening in the worship service. If we're asked to bear some responsibility for it, even Absolutely. in some small way. Yeah, I did. Um, I did note. Um, I think it was a some Christian history paper that I had to write. I actually wrote about this very thing okay. about this very congregation. How that practice even looking at a lens within the Episcopal Church because we've talked about you know growing edges and things on both denominations what I really love about particularly the ELCA but about this church in particular is that very practice that we have you know for those who are called and interested a way to engage and we have a little bit of uh little liturgical wiggle room, so yeah. to speak, to get, hey, this person hasn't been to church in a really long time. They've now returned almost as a pastoral act. And I think that, um, because the other thing I was going to, just to riff off of what you <laughs> have said, um, uh, I think liturgy, for me, can also be pastoral care. Yes. And I think many, um, while, while this is, you know, uh, pretty, uh, uh, it's not, exclusive to the Episcopal Church, but many Episcopal clergy will say that liturgy in and of itself can be very pastoral. Mm -hmm. And I think acts that we do here um, can really embody that, to say, this is a moment, okay, let's make that call, bring them in. And so they are there with communion, helping, pouring, doing uh, yeah. whatever needs to be done as a way of embodying that. And not everyone necessarily welcomes that kind of invitation. For many people, the way they would prefer to participate is much more behind the scenes, mm. um, not necessarily in a role where others may observe them. Um, and yet there is so much in the liturgy that can be offered to people and say, would you? Right. And my own pastoral practice of that kind of invitation really began for me in the years that I served in campus ministry. Mm. And one of my favorite recollections, um, I had served at Teal College in Greenville, Pennsylvania. While I was in that role, we had begun, completed, and dedicated the construction, the appointment, the dedication of a new chapel mm. on campus. And we furnished and appointed it well so that it could serve all kinds of occasions. Right. And we had a thurible, for mm. example, so that there were certain services that we could use incense. Love that. Many of the students who would participate in worship came from very evangelical, more in the familiar United States use of that term mm. than in the historic sense of the term that Lutherans mean when we say evangelical. For many of the students, um, almost a non-denominational, and they had a sort of 
studied aversion to anything that could remotely look like high church, right. let alone Catholic. Right. Which, but, is, which in some circles is a bad word. Yes. So that's right. Exactly. But it was amusing to me to see how willing students were, because they were completely unfamiliar with the right. use of incense, right. to say, this is how we're going to do it. Would you swing the incense pot? Right. Right. And, you know, many students who would not be caught dead doing anything remotely like right. the mass. Yeah, right. Um, right. We're just delighted because this was fun yeah. to do. And I think, and you and I have often had conversations about this, the sense of fun is important 100%. to worship. Worship should be joyful. It should be playful. Right. Not in a careless, sloppy, or trivial way, but in a solemn way. If it isn't fun, right. why are we doing it? Right. Well, and often in liturgy, and I think about the the sort of the many uh-ohs or slip-ups that had occurred, um, or just the, all right, let's throw this in. Mm -hmm. I think that there is a sense of holy play that mm -hmm. can occur. Because often, I mean, the saying would go, you know, you can make plans and then God laughs. Right. So I think that still applies to something as treasured as the liturgy, that mm -hmm. we make these plans and, and we'll go as, um, as prescribed. But at the same time, there has to be some level of of humanity, of, right. of, of this, this and, right. and which to me lends to this incarnational relationship that yes, we, we recognize the divinity of what we are doing and oops, okay, let's let's twirl around the, the thoroughbore or yep. what have you. I think there's yep. a there there can be there can be this sense of both and I love that. The, what did you you didn't call it a thoroughbore? What did you well, I, said, incense I used yes. incense pot well, that's, I, when I would be inviting right. students. Which, because I was going to say, if you if you went with thurible, I think you would have gotten a very different <laughs> right. response. But it's just like, incense pot, okay, I know that. You know, we can we can make that work. That's a st I love that. I love that. But that's a good insight on your part. Liturgy as an arena, a resource for pastoral care to invite the involvement of people. It is why, for example, shifting to Lutheran, right. Um, history and practice. It is why Luther was such a prolific writer of hymns. Absolutely. Um, it was Luther's intention that those who gather for worship should never, ever, ever be a passive spectator audience. Absolutely. They should be participants. And Luther understood that one of the best ways to give participation to God's people is to invite them to sing. Absolutely. And Luther wrote hundreds of hymns. Mm. Um, well, and that's, I think, where... Because um, the Anglican Church, the Episcopal Church, is so much of this both and. And so that's why, on the one hand, I have, all the, I have absolute respect and just this devotion to the liturgy of letting it wash over you. The good book, as The you good say. book, as I said, episode, I think it was episode <laughs> one or two. But, the, um, but on the other hand, I so agree and affirm that the Episcopal Church, it's sort of its Protestant side, would agree with Luther to mm -hmm. say it is more than just sitting in the pew and letting everything mm -hmm. happen, that there is this participatory... Um, I mean, you see in... Um, even if you're not singing, uh, all of the the works that are done, the canticles that are done in morning prayer, the uh, all of the the liturgies, there it is active mm -hmm. within not only whoever is leading but also those sitting in the pews. So it's it's a beautiful a beautiful mix of tradition. Thank you for referencing that's you know. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And thank you for sharing this time in conversation Absolutely. between the two of us over these four episodes. Nice. And we certainly hope that this will be of interest to you who have listened or watched. Um, and I will say, if you have any other questions, observations about the Episcopal Church, we have our own deeply committed <laughs> resident expert in Daniel <laughs> Catalano. I'm Paul Baglios. And I'm Daniel Catalano. Thank you. As we move into the fall here at ELC, we're preparing for the wonder that is the upcoming Christmas season. With the busyness of this time of year, our episodes for Two Pews in a Pod will now be released on the first and third Monday of each month. We look forward to continuing our exploration of faith with all of you in the months to come. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time.